Hello from Aberdeen. We are on the east coast of Scotland today and it's pretty far north. We're almost in the 60th parallel, which I love it up here. It's a very cold and gray day, as you can probably tell. And today we're starting our journey off with a couple of things. So we're gonna see so much today. We're gonna go see what I'm looking at now. We're gonna go see a castle. We're gonna go see some old stuff from like 6,000 BC. It's gonna be an awesome day. So stay tuned as we watch more stuff. Right now, we are walking across the UK's oldest standing structure. Yeah, like this dates back to the 1300s. Check this out. We are standing over the Dun River, as you can see there below, nice little peaceful guy, and this pedestrian bridge that is just nice and cool that we're walking on. You guys, I may be standing on something that Chaucer stood on. Yeah, so cool. So why is this important? Well, we're starting off in Old Aberdeen. Now, Old Aberdeen is about five kilometers north of Aberdeen train station and like the city center. And it's like a lot of the bricks and stuff that we'll see as we walk throughout this little area were actually handmade bricks. Now, stuff kind of falls apart over time. So a lot of it's been redone to reflect what it used to look like. As you can see here, Brig o Balgoni. It's the oldest in Britain, completed in 1320, supposedly at Mr. Robert the Bruges. And we'll learn a little bit more about Mr. Robert the Bruges as we walk through town, because there's something I want to show you that's very cool about him. Robert, wait, no, the Bruce. Robert the Bruce? Robert the Bruce? Uh, uh, correct me in the comments, please. Robert, let's call him Robert the Rockstar because that's words I know. Robert the Rockstar is a Scottish hero. And when we get to the appropriate time, I'll tell you why. But in the meantime, let's just look at this beautiful looking bridge. Brig, the Brig of Balgoni. And walk through this area. And because it's pretty early in the morning, I'll just put on the music and let you enjoy. I don't want to wake the Brigol Bagoni residents. of us as we walk up from the Brig of Balgoni, we see Aberdeen University. Now the university is located in one of Aberdeen's two old towns. Yes, that's how old Aberdeen is. So on our right we see really old trees. On the left, modern construction. Why? Well, in World War II, Aberdeen was bombed heavily. I don't know why, and I tried to research on why here. Um, I assume it has something to do with its shipping port criticalness and the fact that it has a lot of offshore drilling. So the oil industry is big here. And because the oil industry is big, it means there's a lot of international people here. It brings in this massive population from the university. And I find that pretty cool to be in such a diverse part of Scotland. So I mentioned that Aberdeen has two old towns. Well, that's today. Back long ago, Aberdeen was settled, we think over 8,000 years ago, with two major towns. So there was a town around the Dun River and a town around the Dee River. Now Aberdeen sits in the middle of both of these riverbanks, which makes it exceptional for having summer beaches. So in the summer, a lot of people from Scotland and from the UK, or from down south, come and hang out at the beaches up here. There's not a lot of hard rock, so all of this rock that you see 
that was built here was mined from various quarries. Like it's just not from the ground here because the ground is it's very soft due to the both of the rivers dumping into the North Sea. This may be one of the coolest playgrounds I've seen. So we're in a place called Seaton Park and I came in here because in the distance, do you see the pointy? I see the pointy. We're gonna go see what that pointy is. Could it be our first castle of the day? Maybe, let's go check it out. So, we're walking in this massive park today but it used to all be a town. See, with the fires and with wars and with the uh, Nazis bombing it in World War II, a bunch of this stuff got destroyed. So in front of us sits something now that's been there for a very long time. And it is a very cool church. I thought it was a castle, but it's not. So this church in front of us has been around since the 500 ADs. Yes, that old. Now, you may remember from when we were in Inverness, it kind of correlates with the time when the Loch Ness... English. When the Loch Ness Monster first was discovered. Well, what happened is that there was a pagan group who used to be here called the Picts. I think I'm saying that wrong. So they used to live here and chill out and they were doing their own thing. Well, for whatever reason, the Christians didn't like that. And they demanded that the Picts get rid of their pagan religion and convert to Christianity. So a bunch of um, evangelists came up here and marketed Christianity as a better religion, converted all the Picts and built all of these cool churches that we see. And that's why they stand today. Now, as it goes, some of the churches have been rebuilt. Some add-ons have happened. Usually every new saint that comes in wants to do something new. So yeah, let's go see if we can get inside. It is a Sunday, so I don't know if I'm allowed inside, um, but we're gonna see. And if not, just take some cool photos. It's open. The Puerta's Abierto, look. We're in the Abierto Puerto. So first, we walk through the graveyard. And as we learned in Edinburgh, a lot of family plots um, are here. You buy those a long time ago. And that's where your family rests. Now there's something with how people are buried. Um, the veil covering the vase at the top means something. And sometimes you'll see the veil, like this one, that has a crack in it. Do, 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 do. It also means something. So, if you know what this means, give me a, give me a link, because I want to learn. Like, I remember learning it, and then I forgot, so I would love to learn that. And here we see the entryway to this beautiful cathedral. Let's go walk around it a little bit more. Now in here we see something different. We see a lot of these raised. And I assume that's because the gravestones start to sink whenever they get older and just go on the floor. And then we've raised them so then we can still remember the people there. If that's wrong though, correct me because I think that the history and the obsession that our society has with death is fascinating. And if you haven't watched it, um, I'm gonna be dropping a series very soon called Obsessed with Death. It's entirely different than these vlogs. They go a little bit deeper into psychology and into like some sociology on just the, the fascination that our society has with uh, death. So watch it and Learn, learn some stuff, you guys. Or just get re-remembered if you already know everything. So I've walked all around the church looking for a puerta that's abierto. And I don't see a puerta that's abierto. But what I have noticed is that a lot of these graves that we're seeing, 
It's from people who were born in the 1800s and died in the early 1900s. And that's really, really cool, I think. They're kept so well. Um, a handful of them are from people who were, who used to work at the church. Um, and some of them are just other, other people, but a very close connection with the church. So what we're going to do now is appreciate these very red doors. Appreciation time! And then we're going to go wander outside that gate right there. And we're going to see where it takes us next. So we're walking right now down the middle of the road of Old Aberdeen. It's probably not a great idea because cars are still allowed on here, but it's very early in the morning. And one thing that I want to correct myself from when we were walking around Belmore Castle, um, I was wondering why the buildings were so short. And the reason is because they are easy to heat that way. What made Edinburgh crazy was these 11 story buildings that no one had seen before. Edinburgh was one of the first cities in Britain to lead the way for these skyscrapers. In here, we see a lot of the same shorter Victorian style buildings. And you see at the top, all of the little chimneys, doo -doo 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 -doo. each little chimney pipe connects to a different stove inside the house. So usually what happens is that, ooh, look at this massive tree, right? Yeah. So usually what happens is that the kitchens and all of the heating stuff would just stack up on top of each other. And then it wasn't until later heating systems were invented that there was actually heating spread throughout the house and they had different ways to vent out the smoke. So let's enjoy my view. This building in front of us was built in 1721. We're walking down High Street of Old Aberdeen. For those of you who, viewers who do not know what a high street is, let me tell you. So in the UK, every town has something called High Street, H-I-G-H. -H. And what High Street is, it's a street where all of the main stuff is. So shops and food and anything else you could ever want. So whenever you're booking a hotel or something, and if you want to stay in a little bit of a quieter place, don't stay on High Street. If you love the hustle and bustle and energy that comes on High Street, especially later at night, um, stay. Like, they're exceptional streets, and I love how it's laid out like this. It makes uh, pedestrian lifestyle so inviting. And you can see the sun starting to rise finally. I didn't mention we're near the 60th parallel. So in the winter, it gets really dark. And in the summer, there's about 19 hours of light a day. It's pretty epic if you've never experienced it. You guys, check this out. So first we have this beautiful art with this awesome inscription. And then next to it, all of these old buildings. Look at that. This is the University of Aberdeen. Now, if you're not into school, come on, you've got to be into castles. Wouldn't you want to go to school here? Kind of makes me want to go back. Just so I can go study in that building and stare at it. This is amazing. And this is just like right off High Street. Bonk, beautiful building. There is a um, statue grave thingy here that I want to go explore with you. And it looks like it has some sort of Catholic symbolism in it. Do to how the priest on the top is dressed. I don't know though, and I couldn't find it on Google. So if you guys know what this is, tell me. This is beautiful. 
very ornately decorated. And then right in front of this massive building. And you can tell it's Scottish because of the unicorn. Sparkle Pony. This is the best Sparkle Pony I've seen. Look at that. Jump cut, Sparkle Pony. Look at that Sparkle Pony. So as you can see, the architecture's changed a little bit. While we do still have some of the hand and old bricks here, we see a little bit different architecture. And that's due to the bombings that happened and to the fires that happened. So now we're gonna go into what is called Newtown and see more of that. Newtown is Aberdeen's second old town. And it's part of the two cities that originally started in this area. So I'm gonna hop on a bus and I will see you there. So why am I taking the bus? Because it's free and my feet are tired from yesterday. And I think it's cool that randomly Aberdeen will make the bus free. So we talked about, ooh, car's gonna run into me. We talked about Robert the Rockstar. And I want to show you who actually Robert the Rockstar was. But first we're gonna walk in front of this very cool building. This is currently a building that Aberdeen works out of, Aberdeen the city. And we're gonna go walk up to this giant horse statue as you learn more about Robert the Rockstar. So Robert the Rockstar was a king of Scotland long ago. Now, when we were in the Highlands, you learned that the Scottish and the English kept fighting. The English wanted this part of the island. The Scots were like, go away, this is ours. Well, because the English were also kind of mean to the French, the Scots and the French formed an ally. And Mr. Robert the Bruce, the same dude who commissioned the bridge we walked over this morning, he was one of the people who ruled the Scots in the 1300s. And what he's famous for is burning down his own castle. You see, they decided that it wasn't worth it to let the English live in that castle and have their castle. So, if Robert the Rockstar was able to burn down the castle, no one could have it. So he rallied all of his troops together and they went in and they burned the castle down. Now there's one more really cool thing that I need to tell you about Robert the Rockstar, but first I have to find it because I just know the thing, but it's cooler if I show you. The first thing I'm gonna do though is find a coffee. Let's hope this coffee is open. I got up super early this morning again and earlier before any coffee got up, I made a new mistake and forgot to bring coffee with me on this trip. So let's go see. Peace. You know you've reached epicness in life when you're awake and before the coffee's awake. That's okay, because I found something other really, whoa, I found something other. I found something really cool. I want to show you how I look whenever I don't have coffee. Ah. So we're standing right here in front of the Prost house. Entirely butchered that. This is the oldest house in Scotland. And it's been redone and rebuilt, as you can tell, because it's not falling apart. But right now it's a museum. And inside there, you can learn all about the different people of Scotland. There's a super old sign here, some stones. So let's talk about the carvings in these stones. So long ago, people used to carve the stones on what was important for the culture. So here we have a poppy, which is a very beautiful flower that's grown around here. We have some grapes, which dates back into the French alliance and all of the good things that come from grapes, like wine. We have some pine cones, and I think that's super cool. We have a door that I'm about as tall as, a coat of arms, and a very cool, very cool thingy. Up here, though, is what I wanted to draw your attention to, right there. It's a clock. So we have digital and analog clocks now, but before that, you have to have a sundial to tell you what time it was. Isn't that cool? 
And over here we have more old stuff. And over here, peeking in between these buildings, teasing me with coffee that's not open yet, is a very cool castle. Maybe we should go and check it out. Woo! It wasn't a castle. It's another church. Let's go look at it. Church. This is the churchyard of St. Nicholas. And we will go explore that in a bit, but there's still the thing I need to show you. And I think it's hiding in New Old Town. So we're gonna go walk in New Old Town. The difference between New Old Town and Old Old Town is two different towns. And one is older than the other one. So this one was built, I believe in the 1800s, but that could be inaccurate. All of the buildings I'm seeing have 1800 stamped on them. In front of us, I'm not sure you can see, there's a giant statue that we're walking to. And I feel like it's going to tell us something very important. Jump cut, a giant statue. Okay, I'm almost at the giant statue, so no jump cut there. I finally found what I'm looking for. Look, okay, so here we have two lions with the inscription Bon Accord. And Bon Accord is exactly what I was looking for. So it's obviously not English, it's French. And so whenever Robert the Rockstar was rallying his troops to go burn down his own castle, that was his password. He said Bon Accord and everyone knew that that was the password to go in and to burn the castle down. I think it's pretty cool that they still have that on the street signs almost a thousand years later. So now we can finally see the giant statue. This is a giant statue of William Wallace. Now, one interesting fact about Mr. Wallace, on top of being a really good soldier, he was also massive. So we still have his sword and he used a claymore, which you can see in his statue right there. And a claymore, they would make them custom for each fighter. They would measure it up to the chest. And that's how they tall they knew the sword was. So we can imagine that Mr. Wallace was probably around seven feet tall whenever he was fighting. Why is that important? Because everyone else around that time was around five foot four. So he was this massive dude with a sword basically as tall as everybody that he was demolishing. Every town in Scotland has a William Wallace statue and every town treats it in a different way. You go to Glasgow and the Wallace statue always has a traffic cone on his head. You go to Edinburgh and the William Wallace statue is cheering for the football team of choice that day. Here it's this massive statue that I've not seen that big before. So we've learned so much. Let's go explore a little bit more of the old town and grab a coffee. And then I think it's time to go see a castle. So in front of us is St. Nicholas's Kirk. And this church was built in multiple stages. So first one guy built a very small chapel. James Gibbs re-architected it in the early 1700s. And out in the graveyard, there's a bunch of very, very beautiful graves. We can't go in the church, but inside some of the oldest wood carvings are in there. This grave's beautiful. So this grave we see in front of us is from 1696. And just look at that. That is all hand carved to commemorate someone that had a pretty good Scottish life. We've walked a bunch around Aberdeen today. And one thing that you may have noticed is that everything is brick. It's all beautiful. You probably saw this in Edinburgh as well and a bunch of other places that we've been here in Scotland. Why? Why isn't everything wooden? Because when you go to places like the US or in Canada, you see a lot of the older buildings being built in wooden stuff. 
Well, wood floats. And the UK, the British Isles, had a massive navy. And so why would you use anything that you could use to float a ship to build a house or to heat a house? So by using brick, A, they stopped the spread of fires, which a bunch of fires happened anyway. They also were able to focus all of the timber to go into the ships and it lasts longer. Brick is a better insulator to keep the cold in, wait, to keep the heat in and the cold out than wood is. And because the country is so small, there's a limited amount of wood. And so you had to focus all of the wood where it was absolutely necessary, and that was in the sea, both for war, for trade, for travel. So I find it pretty cool that every country adapts to what it has at hand. So now, I am going to a castle. Would you like to come with me? Maybe you do. You see that? That's where we're going. Way far in the distance. Dramatic zoom. <laughs> yep, car's gonna run into me. This is Donatar Castle. We are approaching Donatar Castle. Now this castle is old, really, really, really old. Well, it's always been called some different names. The Picts are the ones that first had an establishment in this area. Now, we'll get to all of that in a bit, but one thing that you probably already know is what it looks like, because this is one of the, if not the most photographed castle in all of Scotland. So in all of the Scottish tourism stuff, I guarantee you've seen it. We're gonna see it today. Dunatar Castle has been the iconic setting of who owned this area for so many years. See, it's handed over ownership from the Scottish to the English, to the Scottish, to the English, so many times that I can't even remember them. It's such a fairy tale. So the mound that it's built on, there's something really cool with the geology with this. It was formed millions of years ago, and because we're on the bank of a riverbed, it's just like this sludge, and there's rocks stuck in it. I don't remember the exact name, but it's super cool. Now, the first establishment that was here at Dunatar Castle was set up by some dude who was marketing Christianity. See, he thought that it wasn't cool if you weren't a Christian and he wanted to make everybody a Christian. So he came in here, and at the time there was a massive picked fort up here. Definitely not a castle like it is today because that was built a little bit later on, and we'll get there. So he came here, and all of the people living here, he gathered and he forced them to convert, and he built his first church in this area, which you can't see because we're walking, but we'll get there. So after the guy built his church here, I guess that stayed for a while because the next major incident that happened in there was when the Vikings came in. See, they wanted it too. So they came on down around 900 AD and they're like, oh, it's ours. And they claimed it for them. And they stayed there for a while. Well, we're in Scotland. The Scottish people didn't like it and they tried to fight back, but the Vikings had better ships and better weapons at the time. And so they just had to give it to the Vikings. Let's get a little bit closer and I'll tell you who got the castle next? It's one of Scotland's most exciting stories. It's like ping pong, but the ball is a castle. Castle pong. This is such a cool rock, you guys. Millions of years old. Millions of years of stories. Look how steep these cliffs are on the side. That's gonna come in to the next part of our story because 
it gets exciting. Someone jumped over the side. Dun dun. So at some point between 900 AD and 1300 AD, the English came in and they took over the castle. And for a while, they chilled out here and they called it theirs. But are we in England? No, we're in Scotland. And this brings us to William Wallace, that giant statue we just saw in Aberdeen. So William Wallace rallied up his troops and he said, men, let's go get the castle. And they rallied up here, they came into the castle and they took it back from English ownership. Now, William Wallace was so pissed off at the English that it's alleged that he burned the cathedral down and he set a massive fire making anyone nearby jump off of these super tall cliffs into the North Sea. Now, it doesn't capture it really well in the video, but that's a massive fall. And I don't think that you would survive if you actually jumped that far. So after William Wallace's raid in here, he captured the castle back and brought it back to Scottish ownership. Now, remember, it's Castle Pong. It didn't stay in Scottish ownership for very long. Then the English got it, and then the Scottish, and then the English, and then the Scottish. And then the Scottish finally ended up with it. Now, the interesting thing is that this is the castle where the honors that, we, that I saw in Edinburgh were hidden whenever Oliver Cromwell of England invaded Edinburgh Castle. So the honors were protected in here. Now, after the honors were protected and brought back to Edinburgh, this castle kind of was left by itself. So from 1717 until the 1900s, it just went into ruin. Nothing was done with it. And that's why we don't have any roof on the castle today or anything. But then it gets better. Don't worry. In 1900s, early 1900s, a nice lord and a lady bought this castle and they saw how beautiful it was and how much epic history it had. So they restored it into what we have today and they stopped all of the bad stuff that was happening to it, like nature tearing it away. So while there's no roofs, we can thank Lord and Lady Chow Chow Cowdery, Lord and Lady Cowdery, for giving us this beautiful castle. And we're going to explore more in here. I mean, just imagine William Wallace and his troops in here, booting everybody else out. I'm not sure if the mic is catching it, but you can hear a dove. Imagine how it must have been with thousands of men just screaming war. Ah! Coming in here, it must have been an epic, epic energy battle. The old kitchen. So if you were hungry, this is where the cooks would cook the stove, where the smoke would go out up there. Boink. And of course, since it's a castle, you have to guard. So that's why we see a lot of these arrows. It was just enough. Arrow holes are just enough to go spy on someone. There's a secret entrance here, you guys. Guys, the port is abierto. And I have a light. Let's see what it is. Oh, this is cool. So this would have been a storeroom. 
to store a variety of things in here. So cold stuff and warm stuff. There was probably a lot of vases that just sat here in the corner to be taken out and used to cook. And then out of the kitchen, of course, you have to have somewhere to eat the food. So let's go up some stairs and see where we would have eaten the food. If we were Mr. William Wallace or Queen Mary of Scots. Oh yeah, I forgot to tell you a very important fact about this. So, in when Queen Mary of Scots was around, she stayed in here for a little bit. I don't know if she liked it or not, but she stayed here. King John also stayed here. Bunch of old royals. I like how up here you can see how the rock is just very smooth from being chiseled away from all of the wind. This was the massive dining room that they used. So of course this hall would, ra or this area here would radiate heat because it's right above the kitchen. How cool would it to be eating in a room with that as your view out the window? <laughs> Sign me up, Royal Life, assign me up. So I'm not color tuning this video at all. So you can see how bright green these walls are. They're beautiful. This is so gorgeous. Pretty. This castle's got riz, you guys, and I'm all into it. It's done its job. Now, I know I'm not coming here in high tourist season, but this is amazingly empty. Usually, for tourist attractions like this, there's so many more people. I'm loving it. The wind is blowing me off and blowing my scarf off. I need you, scarf. Keep me warm. Let's go check out this blacksmith area. So you can see here, like the old uh, fur, fern, urn, fire, fire thing that would have burned. A nice arch here. And over here is where they would have kept some animals. Today, it looks like they just hold fences. And I assume the fences are for the more touristy time. Um, whenever people need help staying in line. So in here, you guys, have you played Diablo? Because this reminds me of one of the things in Diablo, one of the dungeons in Diablo in the campaign. Like the room is exactly the same. You enter in that door and then here you fight off some spiders and then over here you fight off some spiders and then in that corner over there that's where the boss spider just randomly starts to appear. Hmm. Hmm. Blizzard, I'm on to you. I think you just copied a Scottish castle to create Diablo. Which, well done. I would have too. Business trip. Great excuse. So in here, there was probably all sorts of horses, obviously. Maybe some chickens to give the people some meat to eat. A little fire to keep the horses warm. In front of us is where, allegedly, William Wallace burnt down the chapel. And the thing is, like this place, is in the middle of where all of the soldiers would have been. I want to show you what's on the other side of the chapel. So we have the chapel here. Right behind it, we have this massive drop off. And we'll go inside the chapel in a bit. But I want to show you like how ruthless Mr. Wallace was of not letting anybody have the choice. They could die in fire or they could die by jumping over this cliff. I hate war.
We had to run into the North Sea. So we're underneath the church right now. And in here, it's said that there's ghosts that appear. So one of the ghosts that people see is from a picked woman and her children who were converted to Christianity. I'm not sure if by force or by death. And then the other ghost people see in here is someone from Scandinavia, from the Viking times. How cool. Check out this underneath of the crypt. The church, the kirk. Under here, a bunch of stuff was done. Like they made bread down here. There was a bakery, there was a brewery. Now it's where all the ghosts live. So, you know what? Maybe the ghosts just want to have a party. I don't blame them. I like a party too. We're in another kitchen. So this is from the 1500s. Medieval kitchen, medieval window, looking out at a cliff that's been around for millions of years. Medieval sink. They would have brought water in from somewhere. There's some pipes, not pipes, there's uh, drainage, way, drainage things in the walls. Medieval sink. Massive medieval oven. On the bottom, you can see the fire marks. This would have made so much food for all the people living in here. Probably actually cooked for Queen Mary of Scots. So we just walked through her servant's house. Now over here is something very important and it's like right outside of the kitchen. So the cistern collects rainwater and groundwater. It rains a lot here and the water seeps in the ground. And so it was able to go and populate all of the water in the kitchen. Now let's go check out the cellars. Oh, well, that's above ground. I was expecting to go below ground. Bye awesome castle. That wraps up our castle adventure up here. So recommendations, would you go? Castle entrance is 10.50 a person. Um, castle is very cool. Castle is very quiet. Castle is very peaceful. I would say, yes, you should absolutely go. Now it is on the more expensive side and you do need to have A, good shoes and B, be okay with walking. So sometimes the floor is like this, which can be slippery at times. And because it rains a lot, it's always muddy. So you know, bring appropriate weather gear. I would rank it four out of five stars. And the reason for that is just the cost. You, it's kind of hard to get to, so you have to figure out how to get here and then you have to get in the castle. But that said, you should absolutely go because I went and I have zero regrets about it. So let's get out of this castle and then we're gonna go to our next little adventure. Now, if you're wondering, this looks amazing to fly my drone. Can I fly drones around here? Yes, you can. You can go take drone photography in this entire area, but not when the castle is open. You have to wait until the castle closes and the opening and closing times are on the website, but it gives you plenty of time to catch sunrise or sunset. Highly recommend you guys try that out if you're a drone flyer because that'd be pretty dope. So usually the castle opens around 10 a.m. and closes around 2 or 3 p.m. Plenty of time. So do it. If you do it, tag me in your video because I want to see, because it would be pretty. So we are making our way, progressing to that. Not a bad day for a hike. So I mentioned before 
that Lady Cowderry and Lord Cowderry, the Cowderries, bought the castle that we just saw in 1919. Now this was the beginning of World War I. So they bought that castle and all of the land around here. Well, in the early 1920s, after World War I had ended, they got wind that they wanted, the Scottish wanted to build a memorial to remember all of the people that lost their lives in World War I. So immediately, Lady Cowdery was like, absolutely, build it on this hill right next to my castle. So she donated all of this land and she donated a bunch to the War Memorial Fund. Now, why is this important? Well, even though Scotland does not have very many people, about 25% of all of the UK's people who died in both World War I and World War II were from Scotland, which is a shockingly large amount. And that's another reason why all over Scotland we see so many different war memorials. Partially, you know, it is part of the culture and the fight that Scotland has always had to keep its land, but then also to remember what happened so it doesn't happen again. And I think as our world is in such chaos these days with bombings going on, like especially the UK now doing crazy stuff in the Middle East, kind of makes me think we've forgotten. And that's why I keep showing you all these things to try to make us remember again. So as this was built for World War I, a lot of the World War I signs up here were big battles fought. We see Ypres, we see Mons, we see Gutland. Vimy is up here as well, which was a massive battle that the Canadians helped with. And as you can see, it's left unfinished up top. And that's intentional because the people who lost their lives in this war, they had unfinished lives. It's a pretty cool feature up here. As you can see here, this is the memory of people who lost their lives in World War II. World War II was added in after because this was finished in 1923. So, that's our adventure. Um, I'm stuck. The port is not abierto. Okay, port is abierto. This is our adventure into remembering that you should not be a dick. Be nice. Life is just once and we want to live it to our fullest. So let's go explore and see what else here is in Scotland. I have a very complicated train and bus situation going on. So I may or may not be able to take you to a thing that I would like to go see myself. Maybe you will be as excited about it as me. Okay, until next time. So I've just gotten off the bus on this little tiny country road and we're gonna take a walk up this beautiful country road and see something that's very, very cool. So let's go enjoy the country road and maybe we'll find a sheep and we won't tip it over because the sheep run away from me. I've tried to pet one today already and he ran away. Isn't this pretty? I hope I've convinced you to come and visit Scotland because it's really, really pretty and it's totally worth it. Peaceful and quiet, a little bit cold, but you just wear clothes and it's fine. We've had an adventure, you guys. So I am supposed to be behind that stone wall looking for an old stone circle. See, Aberdeenshire has the most surviving stone circles from the Bronze Age. But instead, I'm on this road and what Google told me I could get to behind there, there's not the trail there that they said it was supposed to be. So now I'm just walking on this road 
and looking at the beautiful scenery. And I'm gonna see if there's maybe another entrance where I can just bushwhack in there. It's so weird. Come on, Google, stop lying to me. I want to go see a stone circle. So I'm gonna tell you about the stone circle and tell you why I'm so excited to see it. So the stone circle was built in like 3000 BC and it's massively old and it's a recumbent stone circle, meaning one of the stones is intentionally put on its side. And that stone was specifically chosen and it's not like any of the other stones in the stone circle. Now the thing about the stone circle that I really wanted to go explore is unlike the other stone circles around here, it was used for burial. And like in the center, there was this massive cairn that was set up, which is probably where they did all the burning. And the burying they did either in the circle somewhere or in the, in the area nearby. So I'm gonna see, this is the wood I would have to bushwhack through. And I don't know if you can tell, but that first bush, it's a very pokey bush. But up here, where it's kind of brown and then green, there may be a break in the shrubbery up there. So I'm gonna see if I can get through it that way. And then if not, I guess I'll just have to go catch a train back home. So this is the bush I would have to walk if I want to get into the stone circle. So it looks like I'm actually not gonna be going to the stone circle. So we'll just admire these stones. Now the other thing about the stone circles here in Scotland that I think is really cool is that landowners keep them and they preserve them. See, like when you're riding in the bus anywhere in Aberdeenshire, you see these stone circles just set up in the middle of these massive crop fields like this. And they're seen just as a decoration. So I think that's super, super, super cool that they exist, except this one, maybe I picked the wrong stone circle to go to. <laughs> Oopsie. Um, other stone circle trivia that you need to know. The recumbent stone in the stone circles in Aberdeenshire, it always is on the south side of the stone circle. And the thing I find cool about that is that they're all built the same. There's some stuff to do with like the sun rising and the sun setting and the stone circles used for ceremonial death. As time went on, they were also used for magic. So as the Neolithic culture evolved and that sort of stuff, magic came into the scene. That was the other reason I wanted to go to this one. So now you know all of the history behind the stone circle that I've not gone to. So I will put a photo of stone circle. Ah. <laughs> Not sure why I'm being honked at. I'll put a photo of Stone Circle um, in, the, in the link so you can see it. I found it! I just don't know how to get there. So I went down this other road and there's no sign on the road and I hope I'm not in someone's front patio, although I kind of think I am. Um, I found it, you guys. How did we get up there now? It's between these trees. So this is why I think I'm somewhere. Maybe that I shouldn't. Well, there was no sign that said don't come in here. I just want to go see the stone circle. Maybe I go here. Do you see it up there? You guys, I found the stone circle. I found it, I found it. Do you see? It's right there. Bunka, bunka, bunka. How do we get up there now? Let's go see if we can. Oh my God. Okay, so on Google, these are really hidden. And it said this one's not accessible. And it's not. But look, we're approaching a structure that dates back 300 BC. Isn't that so cool? <laughs> I love archaeology. Look at this, you guys. So, 
so many religious ceremonies and sales and marketing, selling of cattle, sacrificing of stuff, all were held here. Look at this. So we have this circle here, it's basking as the sun sets. And then right over here in the distance is the stone circle that I was telling you about. I'm gonna see if I can, I mean there's barbed wire here and I don't see a way easy into that one. We get to finally see it. And you can see the mound and stuff here. And like, this is just all, it hasn't been excavated as you can tell. And not a lot of history and studies have been done on these because we basically know what they were about. And for us to go through and understand them all, it's a lot of investment and they're hard to get to. And then we'd have to have a battle with the sheep. Now, I've tried to talk to the sheep today and every time I talk to them, hi, how's it going? They seem to run away. So we're just gonna stare at the sheep's playground of rocks. Thanks for keeping it up so well. Check it out. This place was challenging to find. Like 20 out of two stars hard to find. But oh my God, I'm so glad I kept trying. Look at it. This used to be something magical. All of these rocks here in the middle that you can see falling over used to form a massive cairn in the middle. And it was for something. All of the rocks around the side, especially this one, you can see it glowing. This is made of rose quartz. And we're not really sure the significance of why they picked rose quartz, but they did. And that's cool. We'll go see the recumbent stone in a second. So these other stones here are also made of granite. And every stone was selected carefully. It, right here in front of us, we can see a single piece of granite, another rose quartz below us. So this granite stone here, a lot of magical stuff was done back in the day on it. And we just went, magic stone, magic stone. Okay, so right next to this stone here, we see the recumbent stone lying on the south. Now these stone circles are not formed in a complete circle. It's off by just a little bit, and we're not sure why. It kind of looks like an eyeball if you look at it from a above drone view. This stone down here was specifically laid for ceremonies and all sorts of cool stuff. And then around here, we see this stone here still standing. There was many stones in the stone circle. So you can imagine 5,000 years ago, a bunch of people gathering around here to invoke magic. And I find that pretty cool. Don't you? Magic circle. Yay, I'm so excited that we made our entire quest today. So we saw both an old town in Aberdeen. We saw the new town in Aberdeen. We were able to go see a bunch of castles. We saw memorials to the soldiers who fought in World War I and World War II. And then we saw some of the oldest parts, this stone circle. Scotland is such an amazing place to visit. And I hope, I hope this series has encouraged you to come and explore Scotland. We have one more adventure left that I'm gonna take you on next week. We're going to the Shetland Islands. So stay tuned and I'm gonna show you up what is super far north in Scotland. Like, subscribe, see you up north. Ciao.